Can you believe her, Jeff? Yeah, Jeff, that's a different story. You kind of take that a little careful, but for me, you got to to believe when I'm stopped singing, so don't, don't worry about that. Okay, Ezekiel 37, 1 to 6. Ezekiel 37. And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus the Lord God, thus says the Lord of God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. And I will put sin you on you, and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, that you may come alive, and that you may know that I am the Lord. Tom, it's your turn. I'm done. <laughs> Well, as you're sitting here this morning, you're probably wondering where in the world that is going that has to do with missions. <laughs> and I can appreciate that, but you know, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. I titled this, The Unfinished Task. You know, if you go back and you remember in Acts chapter 2, the Lord gave us all a commission, didn't he? Not just to the missionaries, not just to the pastors and the youth workers, he gave it to the church of Jesus Christ, and that commission is not a suggestion. It's nowhere called the great suggestion. If you feel like going, if it fits in your plan, as long as your 401k is okay, if you have time and you'd like to go, it would be nice if you went. No, he said, go everywhere and tell everyone. That was what the Lord wanted. Now, as I look at this passage, I am reminded, we just sang this morning, which I love, people being the Lord, I think that this is really an important thing to keep our mind because you see i think we forget sometimes that there are unsaved people all around us we don't have to go to, to a foreign country we don't have to go to the bush we don't have to go to china they're right here in Houston. they're right there in new jersey they're everywhere i go it's like brought to you by unsaved people they're everywhere but i want you as we look at this i want you to look at ezekiel 37 as a microcosm this is Israel's situation. Israel says, we're without hope. We've got nothing. This was before she was brought back into the land in 1947 and 1948. Our bones are dried up. We, 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 we've got nothing. And God says to Ezekiel, I want you to preach the words. Don't preach the bones. Now there's, a, there's an audience for you. Can you imagine? Just sitting there looking at a bunch of sun bleached, dead, dry bones. I've had some sudden mornings where it would be sort of similar as I looked out and, and I saw the congregation in the morning look like out to lunch, gone fishing, do not open until two Christmases from now, that kind of thing. But I've never preached to a bunch of bones. He is told to go out and stand on a, on a kind of a flat top hill. They're called tells over in Israel. In fact, if you've ever been there, Masada is one. It's kind of a giant flat top mountain. And as you look out over the sun bleached plain, you're not seeing the sand, you're seeing a bunch of dead bones. They are so sun bleached and dried up that they're almost calcified. I don't know about you, but this is kind of what I see when I go into Texas and I see people with ranches. And they're telling me this is the whatever ranch. And outside the ranch is this kind of sun bleached, dead, dried up cow's head. Doesn't really look too good to me. Like, wow, what kind of cows? Do you got the dead ones or do you have the live ones? Are they all looking like this? Or do they actually have like flesh and blood and bone on them? But God says, I want you to preach to the bones. Hear the word of the Lord. No, when he says prophesy, that's really what he means is preach. Prophecy, he's not prophesying as in uttering some future event that's going to happen. 
He is actually declaring the word of the Lord. That's what the Lord wanted him to do. And we saw in the text that he began to do that. And God began to put the bones back together. And we're seeing in the text, take a look at verse 11. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. They're saying these bones represent Israel. We've got nothing. We're totally cut off. We have no land. We have no worship system that we can actually fulfill according to the word of God. We have no temple. We have no priesthood. My colleague Steve would say, we've got buckus. Nothing. I want you to consider this as looking at Israel's situation in this passage as a microcosm of the human condition. Where are the unsaved people? They're dead. They're lost. They're dried up. They've got no hope. They've got no promise. They've got nothing. Do you realize that when we're around the unsaved, we're communicating and talking with living dead. They may be alive physically. Israel's going to stand up alive physically, but she was not alive spiritually until the Spirit entered her. And that word Spirit there means the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Once the Spirit came in, they were alive. Prior to that, it says they stood up an exceeding great army, but there was no breath in them. And that's really where Israel is right now. She's fighting for her survival. But literally, there's not a spirit in the entire Israeli army. There's not a spirit in the Israeli Knesset. There's not a spirit in the majority of Israel. I uh, had gotten a question from a pastor the other day. He wanted to know if, as this has been happening, he says, I'm not seeing anything at it, but is Israel praying? Is Israel seeking the Lord of this? So I wrote to Menno last night, and I just said, look, you know Russ, but... If you have an opportunity, I have a pastor over here that would like to know what the spiritual condition is in Israel as far as our people seeking, turning the Lord. If you remember, when we got attacked on 9 11, churches were packed out the next Sunday. Didn't last long, but for a brief moment, churches were packed as everybody asked why. He said that there are many believers that clearly are praying and they're sharing, but there's nothing official coming from the Knesset, coming from Jerusalem, coming from the government, that there is a sense of turning, that there's a sense of we need the Lord. And that's sad. Because folks, there's no other place to go. When things get tough, where do you go? You go to the Lord. Lord, a herd or rib, we, we pray. Somebody has a car accident, we pray. We know that somebody's facing surgery, we pray. We go to the Lord. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run in when they're afraid see we have a place to go when we need the lord we have a place we can go we can go right to the lord and we can lay down the burden of our hearts but if you don't know the lord where do you go who do you go to who do you lay down that burden of concern that fear to you see israel's situation in this passage is really a little miniature picture of the human condition just like Israel, people are lost. People need to be made alive. Israel will have a national conversion someday in the future. Zechariah 12, 10 tells us that they will look upon me whom they've pierced. Matthew 24, Jesus said, you shall not see me henceforth anymore. And Jesus said, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. There will be a national conversion for Israel. Right now, Jewish people are being saved one at a time. I told Lorna, she's a preemie. You know preemies are the ones that are born early. She's one like Paul. Paul says, I'm one born out of due time. There's a time when national Israel will turn. But I was born early. Lorna was born early. Every Jewish believer that's in the world today was born early. Because God is not willing that they should perish. But if you really understand that you have a heart for the world, you have an understanding of the people of the world, those who don't know Christ are dead. They may be alive physically, breathing. They may be animated and moved, but spiritually they're dead. That's why we can't marry an unsaved person. What fellowship does life have with death? You know, I don't go to too many funerals and say, well, I think that, that person that died really is a nice person. Can we get married? Huh. What fellowship can life have with death? 
What do we have in common? Nothing. You see, the world is lost. The state of our world today is not getting better. I hope that you can see that. You know, we have tried and we've tried to put on a positive front and, you know, we, we try to talk about the wonderful things that are happening, but it seems like every time something great begins to happen, something even worse eclipses it. After COVID, I, I, I thought we'd get a little bit of a rest, but we haven't gotten any rest at all. And many people still haven't even come back to church or synagogue yet from COVID, let alone what's going on today. I want to take you now from this picture. I want to take you into the New Covenant. And if you would turn with me to the book of Ephesians. I want to show you what's happened here. The Ephesians, and we're going to go to chapter 2. Now remember, Israel says, our hope is gone. We're a bunch of sun bleached, dead, dry bones. We're dead. Look what Ephesians 2 says. The apostle waits. And you be made alive. Who were what? Dead in trespasses and sins. Folks, there was a point in the entire congregation's life when we were in the same position as Israel. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We had no hope. We were enemies of the Most High God. We didn't know Jesus. We had no promise. We had nothing. But by the grace of God, he made us alive, didn't he? Totally changed our lives, altered our destinies. He changed the directions of families. He changed the directions of countries and cities because of his amazing grace that was shed upon us. He says here in verse two, to which you once walked in which you once walked. Folks, we walked the exact same way. We were dead in trespasses and sins. You didn't have to teach me how to do it wrong. I knew that. My mom's now with the Lord, but if she were alive, she could tell you the grief I gave that woman. I invented ways to do it wrong. I lived from trouble to trouble, surus to surus, problem to problem. Nobody had to teach me the lie. I kind of knew how to do that on my own. Nobody had to teach me how to steal. I knew how to do that. As I stole a pastor's radio. Yeah, we were invited over to the parsonage of a pastor that had been the pastor of my church when I was growing up. And this little kid saw his first transistor radio. I've always had electronics from the time I was a kid to now. And let me tell you, I never saw anything that I remember as being more beautiful than that transistor radio. And uh, it just happened to work its way into my grandmother's car <laughs> and come home with me. Whereas my mom would say, be sure your sin will find you out because all oh, my stars did she find me out. And I was marched back to the pastor's house with radio in hand and apology and returned it, admitting what I had done. We laugh about it now. But you see, that's how sin is. I didn't have to be taught how to do it. It was just an instinct. And that's where the world is today. That's why unsafe people do unsafe things. That's how we can explain what's happening in Israel. They unsafe people do unsafe things because they're unsafe. And folks, I love Israel, but this isn't the first time something like this has happened in Israel. They were taken into captivity by Assyria. Assyria really knew how to be cruel. They literally based their entire civilization on calculated cruelty and how they could keep people in line by how horribly they could treat them. We go a little further, we come to 1492 and as Columbus is setting sail, the Roman Catholic Church had acts the Inquisition. Jewish people were tortured, burned. Jewish people were placed on machines like the rack and stretched so limbs were ripped from their body. They were kicked out of Spain and Portugal with no place to go. You, whatever you can carry, you got it, but everything else stays behind, you're out of here. From there, we have pogroms. If you ever watch Fiddler on the Roof, Fiddler on the Roof is really taking place in the shell that happens during the pogrom period. And we can't forget Adolf Hitler and the Nazi war machine in the Holocaust. So this is just a continuation of what's been going on through history 
Because unsaved people do unsaved things because they're unsaved. You know what changes that? When people meet the Lord. That's what changes us. That's what changes it. Nothing else. You can make all kinds of plans, New Year's resolutions. You can bow to your blue in the face. It's not going to change anything. Only Jesus can change your heart. So it continues on here, chapter 2, look at verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You see, that's, that's where sin leads you. It takes you through your lust. You know why I wanted that radio? Because I thought it was cool. It was a lust. I want that radio. I need that radio. I gotta have that radio. I didn't have the earplug. I couldn't have done anything with it. But rational thought just doesn't enter into your mind when you're dealing with the sin. He continues on, but God, I love those two words, but God. Whenever you see but, you know you're about to go from wherever you are, which is probably not great, to someplace that is off the charts wonderful. I was dead, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you will be saved. Folks, that's where we were. That's where I was. God redeemed this wretched mess. He redeemed it for his honor and for his glory. And that's what God is doing. And that's what missions conferences are about. It's an opportunity to get together and begin to look beyond our four walls and to look at what God's doing in the world and how we can fit into it. What would God have us do? He has given us so great a salvation. And God is calling men, women, young people today, saying, leave what's behind, go to the place that I will show you, just like he called Abram from Ur the counties to go to a promised land. Many have answered the call, but there's still, there's still need for more. I haven't had the privilege of being here all week, but if there's one thing I've come to understand about missions is we always need more missionaries in every field. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you, if you were to ask every missionary that's here, they would say that, yeah, come, we need you. We need bodies, we need human beings. Because the fields are white at the harvest. And we've got no laborers. You know, in Israel, after the attack of the seventh, the crops were ready to come in down near Gaza. There was nobody left to harvest them. Because everybody that was going to harvest them was either in the defense of Israel or banned from the country because they locked out the, the Palestinians that used to do the harvest. Finally, because of the need they relented, you didn't see this in the news, but they allowed a number of Palestinians to come in to help with the harvest because the bottom line is they need the crops. They had lettuce and tomatoes and corn and all kinds of crops because it's that time of the year, it's time to bring it in. And they had no way to do it. That's what the Lord said. I've got no one to send out for the harvest. So many mission agencies are, are are drying up because there's no new people that are accepting the call. And we're getting old. You know when I started? I was in my 20s. That was a long time ago. Never going to see those days ever again. They're gone. But when you realize what God has done in your life, how God has totally changed everything. You were dead in trespasses and spends. Now you're alive in Christ Jesus. You were headed for a crisis eternity, now absent from the body, is present with the Lord. It just keeps getting better and better because of what the Lord has done. And the songwriter says, give thanks with a grateful heart because of what he's done. And we need to do that. We also, you know, when, when somebody gives me a gift, I not only want to say thank you, but I want to do something to act on that. I want to give something back. I want to do something to minister to the people that, that gave that gift. 
And I think that we really should want the minister to say thank you to the Lord for so great salvation. People need the Lord, they're your neighbors. They deliver mail to your house. They fix your car, they'll help yours breaks down. Until I got my new car by the lift in the shop. I thought maybe the Lord was wanting me to give them the gospel because it spent more time there than I did in the car. <laughs> but the point is, these people need the Lord. He continues on. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ that in all the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Why? For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Folks, that's why we're here. You see, that microcosm met a metamorphosis. God took the ugly caterpillar, me, and I became a beautiful butterfly in his eyes, not yours. I, I get that. I'm, I'm working with that. You know, sometimes all you can work with is what you've got. And, you know. But a metamorphosis, just like that caterpillar, spins the cocoon. And it goes in this really kind of ugly bug. It comes out this beautiful butterfly. Well, that's where we were. We were dead in trespasses and sins, and God totally changed our life. And He made something beautiful, something good, not something that was ugly and totally useless. God changes lives. God is all about changing hearts. That's what God does. And it doesn't matter what we've done. I'm reminded of, you know, we're, we're living through a, a mess, but I remember reading you know, the account of Corey Tenboom during the Holocaust and the, the Germans that had really killed and tortured her family. And you'll remember her sister, Betsy, before she died, she said, look, it's easy to hate, no hate, Corey, no hate. And then Corey was forced to meet the guard that had been the one over her sister that had been responsible for her death. But all of a sudden, he had been transformed. He was no longer the, the Nazi. He had been changed. God gloriously changed and totally altered his life, his destiny, everything. And now he was a believer. And she was able, by God's grace, to put the hate aside because of what God had done. And folks, I pray that that's what we'll be about that will be about sharing God's love with everyone because God is not willing that any should perish. Jewish, Gentile, male, female, young, old, rich, poor, he's equal opportunity by God's grace. And the Lord is saving daily such as should be saved. Now how do we go about doing this? I'm glad you asked. You have your Bibles one more time. We're gonna to turn to the book of Colossians. I want you to see in Colossians, Chapter 4, how God tells us we should do this. You see, Israel is the microcosm. Salvation is the metamorphosis. Well, here's the methodology. You've got to have your three points interrupted. Here's the methodology that gets it done. Take a look at Colossians chapter 4. Let's begin in uh, verse 2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And then he says, meanwhile, pray also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I also am in chains. Folks, that's something that I guarantee you you can pray for every single missionary that serves the cross of Jesus Christ around the world. We want open doors. We want to talk about Jesus. That's what we love to do. When I fly, I beg the Lord to put me next to somebody who'll talk. When I'm sitting on a train, I'd like to talk to somebody. That's what I want to do. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk to every person that's got a face. I'd like to be able to talk to them about God's amazing love. Sometimes that happens. And I just rejoice when I get off that flight because I am so excited at that point I couldn't go to sleep if I had to. 
I could have been up for 48 hours. It wouldn't matter. I'm not going to bed. Because I'm so excited about that open door. Folks, that's what we can pray. You can pray for us. You can also pray it for yourself. Lord, could you put someone in my path that I can talk to about Jesus? Someone I could share something with, maybe give a track to? Someone that I could just meet and have an opportunity to give a word from you to them? We need to pray and we need to ask the Lord for open doors. You know, you know why you often don't have it? Because the Bible says you have not because you ask not. I wonder how many times we pray about that. You know, we have prayer meetings, we have prayer times. Do we ever ask the Lord, what is someone in my path that I can love? We used to sing the song, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. Do you have anybody that you're loving to Christ? Do you have anybody that you're sharing with? There was a man who founded the ministry of the Navigators. He was speaking up at Word of Life. Bible Institute. And as I understand the story from what I've been told by Jack Wirtz and others who were there, one of the students from the BI fell into the water. Dawson Trotton immediately jumped in and held her up until she was rescued, but it cost Dawson Trotton his life. Dawson Trotton's famous words were, where's your man? Where's your woman? Where's the person you're pouring your love into? The person that God would have you share with. Where's your man? Where's your woman? I would ask that today. Where's your man? Where's your woman? Where are you going with your love for the Lord? It's one thing to talk to us. I love talking to the choir. I don't get killed that way. I don't get hurt that way. But the bottom line is, you're always saved. What about the people who are? We continue on. Colossians 4, let's go to verse 4. He says, pray also, verse 3, that he was set an open door before us so we could speak the word. Verse 4, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. The word manifest means that it would be clear. It's not enough to be able to share the word. We want the word to be clear, don't we? We want to put the cookies on the table where they can get them freely because the gospel's free. One time I was invited to a church to preach on pre-venial grace. And I sat there going, what in the world is that? Obviously I didn't grow up with venial sins and mortal sins and whatever, but pre-venial grace. Folks, that's not the way we want to approach it. We want to talk to them about something that's so clear, that it's so easy to get. We need to make the word of God as clear as possible when we share it. We need to really, really make sure that God helps us to understand it so we can not confuse people, but hopefully answer their questions and let them know how much God loves them. He loved them so much he sent his son to die for them because that's why John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world. Jesus came so that no one would be lost. We need to pray that the Lord will help us to make it clear. He also says, verse 5, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Walk in wisdom. You see, I've already mentioned unsafe people do unsafe things. So if I'm forming a business, that's not going to be where I'm going to go for a business partner is to some unsafe guy or gal. I have been asked so many times about weddings, and yeah, I don't do weddings of unsafe people and safe people. That's not the kind of evangelism I'm called to. We need to walk in wisdom towards those who are outside. We need to understand where they are in the economy of God and how much God loves them. And we need to love them too. We also need to look to be able to share with them so that they won't be outside, but that they could come inside the camp, that they could be one with us in Jesus the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the gospel. So we need to understand unsaved people do unsaved things. But that doesn't mean that they're not worthy of our love because they certainly are worthy of God's love, aren't they? And there's one other passage that I want to look at here. I want you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews in chapter 13. Hmm. 
the verse where he says that we are to walk respectively of the Lord, that we should always live as if his coming would be today or tomorrow, and that we need to be able to have a heart to share that with them. Not only are we walking towards them in wisdom, but we're walking towards them with a heart that we should never want them to not be saved. He talks about that throughout the Bible. There was a verse in Hebrews that I had, I lost it. Obviously, it's still here, but my brain is <laughs> Folks, the gospel is really easy if you think about it. In fact, I think that's why humanity struggles with it so readily, because it's so easy. They want to do something. They want to think it's hard. I've got to work. I've got to stress. I've got to strive. I've got to do something. I've got to change. I've got to try to please God. I've got to crawl up hills on my knees, carrying crosses over glass because I have to beat myself up because of what Christ did. The gospel is very easy. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. It's, it's not rocket science. It is so easy. And I think that's why so many people stumble and fall because God has made it so easy. That, no, it can't be that easy. There's obviously got to be some affliction in there. I want to afflict myself. I want to beat myself up. That's not how God works. And if you're a believer and you're going through difficult times, and I can tell you, as a believer, yeah, you're going to have difficult times. He didn't say that it was all going to be a bowl of cherries. Actually, he could have said it's going to be the pits. Because many times, as we go through our lives, we get the pits and not the cherries. <coughs> But you know what? That's why we call the name of the Lord, and that's why he helps us. As the hymn writer said, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that he could solve it. I wouldn't know what faith in God can do. But through it all, I learned. Oh, how I learned. Now we have one final point, and I want to just share this with you to give you a little heart. You know, to be able to accomplish this, you have to, you have to do a little planning. You have to be ready. So for the methodology, you have three Ps. Prepare, practice, and persist. Prepare. You need to carry tracks, carry a Bible. Be prepared to share plainly. You gotta be ready always to give an answer to hope that lies within you. You know, I, I, one of the greatest things the Lord ever gave me was my wife. She carries a purse. You could lose my tenant in that purse. <laughs> it's so big. And I, I couldn't find anything there if I tried. She said, could you get my phone? I said, is it any place in particular? Or is it kind of rolling with a herd? <laughs> <laughs> you need to prepare. Carry some tracks with you. I'm sure we have a track rack. Pick some up. Carry them with you. Read them before you share them. As you share, as you interact with people, pray about what to give them. Pray about leaving them with a piece of literature that you could give them because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And tracks are a wonderful way of getting little bits of the important word of God for them to read it and see it. Also your Bible. You know, when, when I first started out with Friends of Israel back in the 70s, we didn't have cell phones. I didn't have a Bible app that had 93 Bible translations including Greek and Hebrew. I had to carry a Bible! No, I didn't carry it. it too big. But I had a small Bible. A New Testament isn't enough. I'm in Jewish missions. Jewish people don't readily embrace the New Testament. If I'm going to share with them, I've got to have the whole counsel of God. And so I learned to always have a Bible with me. Be it on my cell phone now or in my presence, my person, I got the word of God. Because you need to be able to be ready to share that. So you gotta prepare, you gotta be ready. That doesn't just evolve like when I would go up to Word of Life, Jack Wurtz would say, Sid you got any tracks? I had to be ready because I knew Jack was gonna ask for it. You also have to practice. Use it or lose it. Kind of like exercise, there's that word we all love. But we need to go to the spiritual gym and we need to practice. We need to find people and we need to, to practice sharing with them. Practice sharing the gospel. Talking about spiritual things. 
Deuteronomy tells us in Deuteronomy 6 that the Jewish people were supposed to talk about the Lord when they rose up throughout the course of the day and when they went to bed. Our houses should be permeated with talking about the Word. I know we like to talk about the weather. It's getting cold. I know we like to talk about sports. For me, the Phillies lost. Beyond that, there's nothing left. <laughs> They'll be back. We can talk about the election. I'm Tom Sitcox, and I did not approve that message. In fact, I couldn't care less about your message. But we should talk about the Lord like we talk about everything else. It should be part of our regular conversation. He is the most important thing in my life. How can I not talk about it? My wife and I spend hours just talking about the Word. We'll read it and we'll talk about it. We, we, we just discuss it with each other because that's what we like to talk about. I know we're weird. We're missionaries. I get that. But we love to talk about the Bible. And I love to read it in different translations and share it with her. Here, here's what the New King James says. Look at what the ESV says. Look at what the New American Standard says. What do you think about that? How do you take that? This is what I'm thinking. So we need to prepare. We need to be ready. We need to practice to the point that it becomes so natural that it's just like moving into a conversation about the weather, the sports, the Lord. It just, and I can get that way, believe it or not. I, was, I spent a month working in the town of Manhattan. I was on for the Lord every day. And I remember at one point standing, waiting for a train. And this gentleman came up and he was obviously agitated. He was looking for a cigarette. He was looking at the wrong guy here because I never carried a cigarette and I don't have any matches either. <laughs> but we had an opportunity and I went right into just talking with him about the Lord. We talked about the Lord all the way into Manhattan. When we got to Penn Station, I said, if you're hungry, I can't give you any money, but I can buy you anything you want to eat. I want to encourage you. I really enjoyed talking to you. I don't have my money. I only have the Lord's money, but I'd be glad to buy you whatever you want. You want to you want a meal, I'll buy you a meal. You, I, I'm not buying the booze. I'm not buying the lottery ticket. If you want some food, if you need something to eat, I would be thrilled, honored to buy you something to eat. You see, the more you practice, it becomes second nature just to go into that and to talk about the Lord. And then finally, this is my third and last point, I promise. You need to persist. Never quit. Never give up. Don't ever toss in the towel. Don't surrender. Don't capitulate. You know when it's over? Well, the Lord says it's over. Sometimes we'll share with somebody. I've met someone and I share with them for eight years. Eight years. And I know a lot of people thought, aren't we done here? Even he said to me, I must be a real disappointment because I'm not coming around. My, it's okay. I love you no matter what. But ultimately, in the fullness of time, when time was exactly right, Meyer asked Jesus to be his Messiah. And I had the privilege of seeing that man totally change. I had the opportunity to see him go from death unto life before he got saved. I didn't think he could speak a word that wasn't a curse word. After he asked Jesus into his heart, he never swore again. Ever. He was totally one of the most prejudiced individuals I ever met. After he got saved, God totally changed him. He loved everybody. He was hugging nurses and doctors, and he was just so grateful because God changed his life. And I'm thankful that I didn't quit in the seventh year, or the sixth year, or the fifth year, but the Lord gave me the strength, the perseverance, to hang in to a bitter end because the Lord doesn't always work according to our time table, does it? Not everybody has a Billy Graham ministry where you pack out the stadium and 10,000 come forward to receive Christ when you sit just as I am. That's, that's not the real, that's something about Jewish missions. Let me put it that way. We have to persist. We've got to close the deal. And we need to invite them to pray. You know, that's one of the things that I remember when I was growing up that nobody did. The church I grew up in, they presented the gospel to the kids from the time we were in, like, cradle roll, all that we heard the gospel. 
One of the problems was nobody ever asked Thomas of Cups if he wanted to be saved. They kept sharing it. Nobody said, ooh, would you like to receive? Would you like to pray? So that church didn't get the salvation. Billy Graham did. Because Billy Graham was the first one to ask. And I remember hearing that I said, yeah, I'd really like to pray. I really want to get saved. So I tell them, you, you missed out. You could have had it. Billy Graham got it. Folks, never forget to ask if you can pray with someone. Never forget to ask them to pray. If you feel the Lord's laying on your heart, you need to pray with them. Because the Bible tells us that finishes the deal. You need to get them to confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in their heart that God raised him, raised him from the dead. And the Bible says that they will be saved. When Meyer came to Christ, we had been, um, I'll share this just a little story because I really think it's kind of interesting as we look at what's going on in the world. Meyer grew up in a Jewish home, and um, he wanted to go to the high holiday services about two and a half hours from where he was living in the nursing home. He wanted to go down to the shore, to his former synagogue, for the blowing of the shofar at 8 o'clock in the morning. Two and a half hours away from where he was, which was another two and a half hours from me. So for me to get him, I had to get up about 4.30 in the morning, get dressed, go to the nursing home, pick him up, get him dressed, get him breakfast, sign him out, get his meds, and then drive him two and a half hours to the Jersey Shore to his synagogue in Barney. And we went, and the service was packed, because it's one of the big ones, it's the high holidays. And everybody likes sitting up front. I'm, I'm sorry, Baptist, but you know, you, you kind of miss it. The, the Jewish people really want to sit up front because they want to be close to God because the ark is the closest thing that they can get to God. So they pay premium dollars to sit up front. We were in row SS. Now, think about that. Thompson, Coach Missionary, the friends, but add a Jewish guy. We're sitting in row SS, which means we were so far back. By the time they started standing up front, it was like a wave. I had been out of the getting up. And all I did in that service was confess sin. And I remember leaning over to my friend and said, you, you understand what's happening here. I've shared this with you. I've told you what God expects. And all you have to do is to be forgiven of sin. Throughout that day, he kept asking me, what would I have to do? What would I have to do if I wanted to believe what you believe? Finally, I brought him home and we stopped at McDonald's, that classic restaurant, because he didn't want to go home yet. And if you remember, McDonald's always puts a piece of paper on every tray. Very useful. Because I took that, and I wrote the sinner's prayer on the back, and this was actually like the sinner's tome. It was like a book. <laughs> I put scripture in there. He was quoting scripture, the whole thing. But when it was done, I folded it up and I put it in his pocket. I said, I really can't pray this with you because by I'll never know if you do this because of me, because we're close friends and you love me or because you believe it, but you have to believe those words. You have to believe them with all your heart. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing is believing the word of God. He called me up two days later. I did it! What'd you do? What you said? I didn't say anything. <laughs> Why well, pray, And Well, was something supposed to happen? Something Meyer, you were looking at here. But if you were to stand before Jesus, and he were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? He said, I believe in Jesus. Now, you have to understand, when I first met him before, I couldn't even say the name of Jesus because he hated it so much. But then he changed. Got to the Lord in his life. And I'll tell you, when I had the privilege of being at that man's funeral, it broke my heart to be in a Jewish cemetery when I wondered if besides him, anybody else in there ever knew who Jesus was. You know, we're looking forward to a rapture. Jesus is coming again. Amen. I read the Bible, you read the Bible, we know how it ends, and we win. Amen. And someday, every believer is going to be raised up from the grave. And I'm so thankful I know in that Jewish cemetery outside of Philadelphia, there's at least one man. I know there's going to be an empty grave there. Because he put his faith and trust in Jesus as his Savior. Folks, our job is unfinished. We can't quit. Vacation time is over. It's time to get busy. I watch TV and everybody's always hitting the ground running. When are we hitting the ground running? When are we going to get it done? What are we waiting for? If not you, who? 
If not now, when? What are we waiting for? Father, I thank you so much for your word and that you allow stammering tongues like mine to be able to communicate the eternal truth. Father, I thank you for allowing us to be at a missions conference. I thank you for this church and that they still have missions conferences and for all that has gone on this weekend. And I just pray that everything that's been said, done, and thought would be down to the glory, the honor, the praise, the exaltation of Jesus Christ. That you would bind Satan. And Father, that you would burn your heart to the things that break your heart. Hmm. People need the Lord. Is it just a song? Is it just a slide presentation that shows us people that we'll never see from somewhere else in the world? People need the Lord are right here, right now. We live next to them. We work. We drive next to them. Hmm. We buy our coffee and shop in their stores. And Father, if we're not going to get busy, who will? You've called us. May we get done what you've called us to do, and may we do it to glorify you because we love you and thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 I have to confess to you right now, Marge, you're not going to be happy with me because we're only singing one verse of Send the Light. Marge <laughs> likes to sing all the songs, all the verses, but we're going to sing verse 3 because I believe it applies to today. I want you to be seated while we sing this verse, because then I have a thought or two I want to share. Are we ready? Verse three. number one. Number two, he asked about open doors. We're going to close our service. I want every one of you to think of a door you wish was open for you. Maybe a neighbor, maybe a friend, somebody that you wish the door was open. We will close in silent prayer with you praying. Take a minute, and then I'll quickly close at the end for an open door for someone that God is placing on your heart at this moment. congregation have prayed for an open door. I pray for boldness to walk through. Mm -hmm. Many times we get to the door and we just don't walk through. Mm -hmm. I know that's me. That's me. I 
don't walk through the door. Lord, kick us through the door. In thy name, Lord. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you, John.